This state is officially on notice. Colorado, I love you. This is an intervention. The governor issues a warning after Colorado reaches all-time COVID-19 highs. We could end up back where we don't want to be. Denver votes for higher taxes again, intent on trying to solve some persistent problems. But word about something that we may take for granted on Election Day in Colorado. Rural parts of our state get wolves handed to them by those of us who live in cities. And for those hungry, like the wolf, for updates on the presidential race, we'll have any state-by-state -state calls that come down during next. We interrupt today's frantic and clumsy attempts to subvert American democracy to begin with an urgent warning about the state of the pandemic in this state. Colorado could be back under stay-at-home orders by the end of the month. So said the governor on the same day we passed our previous peak for hospitalizations. The state's public health experts are asking all of us to cancel our social plans and hunker down with just our families for a while. Every time you decide not to go to a dinner party, not to go to a friend's house, not to invite someone over to your house, not to, to hang out with friends, you're making a difference in saving lives. Every time you wear a mask, every time you wash your hands when you get it back from wherever you were when you were out. Look, put off those things a few weeks. We'll get back to it. Never before have so many 894 Coloradans been hospitalized with COVID-19. 888 was our previous peak in April. At that previous peak, it then turned down. There is no sign that is about to happen at this point. We're beginning to see an uptick in deaths each day. Now, hopefully, improved treatments for COVID-19 will continue to keep those numbers low. We're averaging 4.6 deaths per day over the last week. Positivity rate yesterday was 11.1%. Brings our weekly average over 10%. Have not seen positivity that high since early May. And the reason we check cases is to see if they're going to plateau, suggesting that we're beginning to control the spread. But no. Almost 3,000 new cases in Colorado yesterday, highest one day total of the entire pandemic. Now, many will be asymptomatic, asymptomatic or mild, but the state says one in 100 Coloradans is contagious right now. President Donald Trump made an all caps call to stop vote counting across America today. If it stops now, Joe Biden wins. So the president's actual strategy is to, to stop the count in some places and continue it in other places. The president again falsely claimed today that he won the election and his son called for quote unquote total war to ensure his victory. The NBC News electoral map has not budged since this time last night. Biden 253, Trump 124. NBC has not called Arizona as other media outlets have for Joe Biden who leads there and in Nevada. Biden's closing the gap in Pennsylvania and Georgia. Those states along with Alaska and North Carolina have not been called by NBC. Here's the bottom line. The president's paths to reelection are narrow and they are dwindling, and that is resulting in increasingly incoherent and frantically false claims from him and his team. At this point, even prominent Republicans at the national level are not repeating them. A Supreme Court case out of Colorado could have a direct impact on the election results. President Trump's allies and his family today urged Republican state legislatures to ignore the will of voters in their states and to install electors that will cast electoral votes for President Trump. A so-called faithless electors case out of Colorado upheld our law here. Similar laws are in 13 other states that bind the electors to the popular vote in those states. Any attempt to subvert the vote would obviously lead to court challenges, but it would be a lot harder to pull that kind of chicanery in those 14 states. So we know that Coloradans have swept Republicans out of power more completely than at any time since the 1930s. Democrats grew their majority in the state Senate by one, and in the House, two newly elected Democratic legislators are already causing change even before they're sworn in. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is back at the Capitol. Plexiglass partitions are no longer the newest renovation inside the State House chambers. Just completed today, a series of ramps that will be used by one of Colorado's newest state representatives. When I was a lobbyist there, sometimes the lift would, lift would be broken. I'd have to climb the stairs, and you want to scare the sergeant at arms. Let them see a wheelchair user climb the stairs in their wheelchair. David Ortiz. Not that one, this one. 
It's Representative Elect David Ortiz. This is the lift he just referred to, which requires a key from the sergeant at arms. It allows someone needing a wheelchair to access the area just outside the house chambers. Now that Ortiz will be inside the chambers, other modifications are needed. They're installing ramps, um, assigning me seating in a certain spot. We talked about uh, short-term, medium-term, long-term changes because we understand that things take time and you have to pay for things. A bathroom just off the house floor has been modified for wheelchair use. This door will become automated. It's a step-by-step -step process that won't be complete by January. When it's his turn to be in charge from the speaker's dais, he'll need assistance until there's a permanent solution. These, however, are just the cosmetic changes as a result of his election. I want to be known for being a champion for my community, so that will include, you know, the Latinx community, that will include, um, you know, those that live with a disability, that will include the veteran community. I want to use my identity to represent a group of people that have traditionally been underrepresented at the Capitol. Iman Judah will be the first Muslim lawmaker, but she's no first timer to the Capitol or being involved in political issues. I'm just elevating my platform from community advocates and lover of social justice and democracy to a formal representative um, at the Colorado State House. And she plans to focus on identity markers. What's that? Being a practicing Muslim, an Arab Palestinian American woman of color. Um, and again, I think each of those identity markers allows me to bring a different perspective and continue to diversify the diversity in our representation. Things happen so quickly after the election. Tomorrow is the orientation for the new lawmakers. Good thing until January, Kyle. Thank you, Marshall. We've got to get his live shot figured out. Um, hey, listen, I transposed uh, uh, some digits in the electoral totals earlier. Uh, again, they have not changed on NBC's map since last night. It is Biden 253, Trump 114. Not what I did it again. 214. Biden 253, Trump 214. I'm glitching like Marshall. So Denver has voted to increase sales taxes again, as it did in 2018 for mental health resources. And this year, the new tax hike is to fund services for the homeless. Now, collecting a pile of money is one thing. Spending it efficiently is another. Our new Roy asked the mayor how they intend to do that. Denver voters keep saying yes, they will pay more sales tax to help those in their community, most recently showing support for ballot measure 2B to set aside millions for those experiencing homelessness. We're going to be able to provide up to 1,800 uh, supportive housing units for our neighbors are experiencing homelessness uh, over the next 10 years. We're going to be able to connect them to services. But one of the concerns is about if the city is using their money in the best way possible. This year, another tax-funded initiative called Caring for Denver to support mental health and substance misuse programs was audited. The auditor wrote, as of May 31st, 2020, the foundation had accumulated almost $41.5 million in unspent tax revenue. The release said up until that point, the foundation had given a few million in grants and that better strategic planning and oversight were needed. In response, Representative Leslie Herod, who championed the foundation, said they did not start getting the money until September of 2019 and were building a foundation ground up and doing their due diligence. We had to do what the ordinance said to do, which was to engage the community to determine what our funding priorities were. We met with over 1,600 Denverites. Since the end of May, the foundation says it's either given or is in the process of granting another roughly $20 million. We bring this up because the two initiatives are funded in similar ways. Denver voters saying yes to a sales tax increase, but the mayor said there's a difference to keep in mind. They'll develop what their program would look like, identify how they might operate. Uh, that is not what these tax dollars will have to wait for. Uh, going forward with regards to 2B. Essentially, the mayor is saying there are infrastructure and programs already in place to address homelessness, and that's the kind of thing 2B money will be used for.
So the mayor is talking about adding and expanding and improving resources. And, and the results we're talking about, those are not official yet, but we are seeing a lot of Denver voters not only support 2B, but they're also showing a lot of support for 2A. So that's a similar sales tax, but the money would be going towards programs working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. And based off of that, the auditor is saying both of those measures already on his radar. Kyle, he's saying that once those taxes are collected, expect it to be audited sooner rather than later, see how efficiently the program is working, which is something that he's done several times with tax increases. So with these tax increases, the public's always told if you raise taxes this much, it's going to bring in X amount in sales taxes, which we can spend. But we also know that, that due to the pandemic's effect on the economy, that tax revenues have been sad trombone this year. Yeah, so if you look specifically at Tubi, right, what you saw in your ballot was talking about bringing in $40 million a year. The mayor has acknowledged in the beginning that number could be lower, like you were talking about, Kyle, right? We're in a pandemic. This is reliant on sales tax. People have lost their jobs. They're spending less. But the mayor says that in the long run, he is hoping that that full amount that was discussed will ultimately be brought into the city. All right, Anush Roy, thank you. Coloradans can be proud of what we accomplished on Election Day. I'm not talking about who won or lost. I'm talking about the nearly 87% voter turnout. Votes that were counted, because that's what Colorado does. Republicans and Democrats work together in this state to build a system where it is easy to vote, hard to cheat, and votes get counted. It is a strong system that can stand up to court challenges. I hope that we don't take that for granted. Now think of the people who voted in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia. People who are now waiting on court challenges to see if their vote, if their voice will be counted. I hope that we all appreciate that being a Colorado means that knowing your vote will be counted. It's what it should feel like to be an American. Some of them are irreplaceable to our family. Some Western Coloradans lost more than a ballot measure to date. They feel their peace of mind was taken from them by city folk. And a struggle is playing out on the walls of Denver as murals with strong messages keep getting defaced. That's next. Who let the wolves out? Denver. Denver let the wolves out with some help from Boulder, Fort Collins, and Colorado Springs. People on the eastern side of the Continental Divide, on the front range, who aren't going to have to worry about seeing a wolf in their backyard when they let out the golden doodle at night. Those were the Coloradans who overwhelmingly supported Prop 114 to reintroduce wolves to northwestern Colorado. It's just squeaked by. 50.3% yes, 49.7% no. Western Colorado, filled with ranchers and farmers who have to worry about animals causing trouble on their land, were very much against this. They're the parts that in red there on that map that voted no. I do see that. I see that the, the people in the big cities are most of the vote where they're not going to have to deal with the, the problems these wolves are going to cause. I've got horses, I've got cattle, I've got chickens. My kids have got horses, and some of them are irreplaceable. To our family. The proposition does allow for fair compensation to any rancher who loses livestock due to wolves. At this point, CBW is going to hold some statewide hearings to develop a plan for reintroduction by the end of 2023. Now, bear in mind, there was a wolf pack spotted in Colorado early this year, way up in the northwest. So, looks like they're already making their reintroduction. The plan to require voter approval for new state government enterprises of a certain size is leaning a bit closer to the yes vote. Prop 117 is 53 percent yes, still too close to call at this point. Amendment C to loosen rules for nonprofit bingo raffles does not approach, uh, appear to be approaching the 55 percent that it would need to pass. It is at 52 percent yes, 48 percent no. The conversations that are created by art are almost more important than the art itself. So what does it say when someone is intent on disrupting that conversation by any means necessary? That's next. Bright murals have changed the look of Rhino over the last few years, including some murals that highlight some other less welcome changes to that same neighborhood. An artist tells us what happened to his artistic call out of gentrification. My heroes, people that I looked up to, have been silenced since the beginning. 
My name is Jolt. I'm born and raised native from North Denver. Such as the communities that I'm from, the culture of street art that has been gentrified. The piece at 27th and Larimer, a rhino, a wolf, and a vulture sitting at a table planning future development for the community, all while making a bad joke. I was hoping to utilize my art as, as a weapon to fight back against the development and to fight back against not only the gentrification of the community, but the gentrification of my culture. It was painted over in the middle of the night. Somebody went out there on their own and literally whitewashed the wall. I went back and I wrote that the piece had been censored due to white fragility. There's other people writing things on the wall now and you know saying things about me that I'm a bigot, I'm a racist, and I'm not here to snitch, I'm not here crying about it. I'm, this is not a, oh, oh, you know, look what happened to me. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for proving my point right. I feel that the whitewashed wall with the statement that I wrote, I think it makes good art. The conversations that are created by art are almost more important than the art itself. So to be an artist that is being censored isn't anything that I'm crying about. It, it, it feels like I'm doing the right thing. That's going to get somebody's attention. Rhino Art District says murals are being defaced across the city, not just there. Joel plans to make his message seen on a new wall during next year's Crush Wall Street Art Festival. Some of Colorado's trails are empty for a reason. It's a call for respecting space. And your feedback, next. So, definitely not you, but some other folks need a reminder that's not how you Colorado. Somebody took advantage of the empty trails at Howe Valley Ranch last week to get in some runs on their bike. That's pretty clear to see. But those trails are empty because the ranch is closed due to wildfire damage. The Calwood fire hit Howe Valley Ranch pretty, pretty hard. Ranch staff and fire crews were still surveying the damage, still putting out hotspots as recently as last weekend. So uh, they're busting out there trying to assess the damage. Uh, so getting in runs on your bike, not how you Colorado. Now, getting out to enjoy the open spots in Colorado, that's a fantastic idea in this beautiful weather. What you need to do, though, is you need to social distance like a dog like this dog in particular, Wheeler, grabs the social distancing stick, you see, to keep everybody six feet away as she walked with her owner, Kirk, on the Highline Canal in Littleton last week. I like this idea. Kirk says that this is Wheeler's thing even pre-pandemic. When you're out, you find the biggest stick you can, hike with it like a boss in your doggles. Henry writes in to say, talking about Colorado voting with 80% participation makes you proud to be in a state where so many take their civic responsibility seriously. Agreed. I mean, and, and I really think that that's something that people can agree on regardless of their political persuasion. You know what I mean? Like somebody looks out at a deep red county on the eastern plains, they show up 85, 90 percent. Boom. Good for them. You know, people in, in, uh, in the city of Denver, they're showing up 80, 90 percent. That's fantastic, too. I hope that that's something that we can share in and be proud of together as a state. Mike and Bailey says... It was not lost on my, on my wife and I that the governor tells us we should cancel the usual 12 to 16 people we have for Thanksgiving, the people I personally need most right now for my mental health. We see a story about how football will go on. Are we in this together, Mike writes. That is a very fair question. This has got to be shared sacrifice if that is what Colorado is being asked to do. As Marshall Zellinger would say, see you next. Ah.